And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. The incense angel stands to the right, carefully cradling a bowl of excess incense. This scene is missing from the London version. The notion of offering incense upon the altar presented some difficulties to the illustrator, who wished to follow the text and at the same time keep it a Catholic church altar with chalice. The solution was to have the altar be only symbolically the place where the sacrifice is burned. Thus, the altar cloth is licked by figurative flames that do not consume it. It is a very good representation of how the church replaced the gory offering of slaughtered animals on the altar of the Jewish temple with the mystical sacrifice of the Mass. The effectiveness of this subtler service is shown by the red-rimmed cloud around Christ's mandorla. The spiritual fire of the altar does indeed carry to God's throne the clouds of incense, sweetly conveying the prayers of the faithful. The superiority of the cloister's version is always most observable in the faces, and the fixed purpose of the angels shows in their expressions. We should bear in mind that angels are pure, immaterial will and intellect. What they intend and what they understand are absolute ideas and unambiguous volitions, without intervening stages of learning or decision. Thus, their frightening, seemingly fanatical focus. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices, and thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake. Here we see clearly that divine actions are the prototypes of, and efficient force behind, earthly events. When the angel uncovers the censer and empties its fire, the heavens open to discharge a tempest that makes earth quake beneath. At the rim of the cloud banks we see the thunderheads. The London shows most clearly that they are uttering gusts of wind, while the Paris needs to be seen for the rich blueness of the sky beyond. The lightning is shown by acute red triangles, and the hail by tiny circles descending in straight lines. This is primarily an affliction of the earth, so we are shown no people. What we do see are uprooted trees, collapsing buildings, and details which are only legible in the cloister's version, a rabbit looking timorously out of its burrow a squirrel attempting to hide in a hole, only its left leg and tail visible, and a bird falling, nest and all, from a toppled tree. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound, and the first angel sounded, and there followed hail, and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. The artist has been at pains to show all seven angels raising their trumps in preparation, and note the intensity of their expressions. Their total focus is shown by the one who plays his horn so intensely his face darkens, evidently from lack of oxygen. He literally blows till he's blue in the face. Here, surprisingly, the London has the most striking overall coloring, using the old graphic design trick of employing a blue background to make the foreground figures pop. The Paris, like the New York, 
puts all its chromatic interest into the garments and halos of the angels. Again, the hail is represented by volleys of circles, and the artist, in despair of distinguishing red fire from red blood, simply repeated the lightning bolt fires we have seen twice before. The destruction of vegetation is indicated by the burning of a third of what a naive botany has rendered as a sort of enchanted broccoli forest on a plain denuded of grass. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Another intense angel blows, and a flaming mountain falls from the cloud-denoted heavens. One-third of the sea beneath turns to blood in an even band directly below the conflagration. The London offers a somewhat more molten-looking mountain, while the Paris has by far the best realized flames. The New York offers the most precisely rendered range of fishes and shows a panoramic maritime drama. Three sailors are frantically paddling away from the cataclysm, Two are already drowned, two are resigned to death in their sinking ship, and one hides below deck, hoping to ride it out. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood and the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Wormwood is a bitter-tasting medicinal herb, so the extremely evocative name here means only that the poisonous meteor made the water taste terrible. We are shown a chillingly Jonestown-like vista of the dead, with the animals frightened by the second trumpet still huddling in their holes. The Paris and London versions include several pots, carried in a hopeless search for drinkable water. In the lower right corner, a lone survivor despairingly contemplates his poisoned spouse. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an eagle flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe! Woe! Woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Above, we see that wide pie slices have gone black in the sun and moon, while many of the golden stars are painted dark. On earth, a squirrel, of which we see only a rear leg and the tail, is retiring into a burrow while the birds are roosting, thinking evening approaches. A barn has been shut, the flocks put away inside. A blind musician is being led back by his serving boy, the day's busking done. A man sits in the doorway of a church, reading his book by the day's last rays. The dusk without has made the interior space pitch black. In the castle... A noblewoman looks out over the landscape now the day's amusements are over. Below her, the falconer has recovered his bird. An idyllic evening vista suggests the unnatural nightfall with serene poetic realism. Across from the angel's trumpet, interpreting its note, an eagle carries a banner saying, Why, why, why habitantibus? Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants. Mm.